Hello, today we are talking about unilateral space maintenance in the form of a chair side band and loop. The teeth being examined today are T as in Thompson and S as in Sierra. S has large, unrestorable, distal occlusal buccal lingual caries. T as in Thompson has a wide mesial band of E1 primary caries. There is also mesial occlusal caries on A, distal occlusal caries on B. Based off of the clinical and subjective findings, we would consider this child to be high caries risk. Based on the caries risk assessment and management for infants, children, and adolescents guideline by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. I'm looking at this workflow and the use of non-vital pulp therapies and primary teeth by James Cole et al. You can follow the pulp diagnosis as non-vital, irreversible pulpitis or necrotic, which is what we have with tooth number S. Pulp therapy, the tooth is not restorable. So our treatment of choice would be an extraction of number S. The etiology of premature loss of primary teeth is most associated with dental caries. Other causes of premature primary tooth loss include trauma, ectopic eruption, congenital disorders, and arch length deficiencies causing resorption of primary teeth. Several studies show that space loss is greater in the mandible than the maxilla if a primary second rather than a primary first molar is lost, if the tooth loss occurs at an earlier age, and if it occurs in crowded as opposed to spaced dentitions. This is true especially if prior to the eruption of the six-year molar. The use of space maintainers to reduce the prevalence and severity of malocclusion following the premature loss of primary tooth should be considered. Adverse effects associated with space maintainers include dislodge, broken and lost appliances, plaque accumulation, an increase in microorganisms and increase in periodontal index scores, caries, damage or interference with success or eruption, undesirable tooth movement, inhibition of alveolar growth, soft tissue impingement, and pain. After the cementation of Tia's and Thompson, a curette and an elevator are utilized to loosen the periodontal ligament around S. Sometimes prior towards the cementation of the crown, I'll do this step. Um, it just depends on how much space loss I have, um, if I want to try to cement the crown prior to or after um, the tooth is extracted. In this instance, I decided to cement the crown first. I'm using a cow horn forcep here in an up and down pumping motion to extract the tooth of number S. When picking out the correct chair side space maintainer ring, there are these cheat sheets that are available. This is from Dr. Larry Johnson in North Carolina. Um, you can Google it and try to find it online, but you can try to look at what brand stainless steel crown you have and see what fits. This is what I have taped on my de novo box so when I'm in the clinic or in the operating room, uh, I can easily find the corresponding size that goes with the stainless steel crown that I cemented. In this example, we utilized a lower E5, so we're going to pick out either a 34 or a 34 and a half ring size. Um, we're just going to have to see what fits better with the tooth. In the next video, we're going to see seating the band and then burnishing it with a band seater. And what you're doing is you're burnishing the occlusal table of the band around the tooth and then using a band remover to take that off. So we're going to see seating the band around the tooth area to making sure it seats correctly. I'm going to use the band seater to make sure that the band sits below the occlusal table of the tooth. This is important. The band should fit snugly to where you have to use the band remover to take off the band. Um, it shouldn't be so easily removed with your fingers and it shouldn't be so snug that it won't fit around that occlusal table. Next step is going to be wire selection. For 90% of cases I select what's called the drop wire. This next step I like to place the wire inside the tubes and actually bend with my fingers um, up and you're going to see that. And what that does is it allows the end portion to sit on the height of the proximal contour. You can appreciate now that there is a little positive bend on those tubes and when that band is seated the drop wire will fit better. The next step is I'll cut about a third or half of the wire off from the drop wire side. Um, I'll use a 330, 169 or 245, any type of carbide bore 
to cut and trim those edges. And then I'll insert them back into the loop portion. And that's gonna be our final product that we try on in the mouth. So we're gonna seat our band again and make sure that the wire is the appropriate length. The band seater is gonna be utilized to move the wire to hit the proximal contour of the adjacent tooth. And we're gonna see that in slow motion here. I'm gonna take that band seater, I'm gonna slide that wire forward until it's touching the distal height of proximal contour of that cuspid. This is what we'd wanna appreciate prior to cementation. The band is seated around the occlusal table and the drop wire is sitting on the distal height of the proximal contour of the adjacent tooth. So then a tube crimper is utilized in a vertical and horizontal fashion to crimp both of the wire areas. Um, you wanna make sure that you're crimping actually on the wire portion and not um, too far above it that you're not actually getting a nice crimp on the wire. Next step you would do that wasn't utilized in this case is using a three jaw plier to farther adjust the contouring of the band and loop. So we're gonna try this on one more time just to confirm that our adjustments were correct and the sizing of the band and loop is correct prior to cementation. Um, we're gonna use a glass ionomer cement that coats the entire band. I will hold the band and loop and fill it with cement Prior to seating it, we're going to deliver the band of loop just like we tried it on, removing excess cement with some gauze using our band seater to make sure that the band and loop is fully seated um, as we tried it on. I usually use a gauze to cover the, the actual band area prior to cementation. That way I know I didn't over rinse the area. We're going to allow the cement to set up a little bit and then remove the excess glass ionomer cement. That's important because in the initial setting phase of glass ionomer cement, it is more easily rinsed out. Mm -hmm.